Greetings, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the house of the Lord, a place where we gather to worship and pray. So glad we had those children's stories this morning. They really, they really were adult stories that were just rewritten for children to understand a little better. Um, but I love children's stories, and, and they captivate our attention. So thank you for sharing those. Um, I was thinking, it was kind of interesting to see how uh, James is singing, and then, uh, sorry, Jason, Jason leading us in the songs, and the story, and the Sunday school, different parts kind of progress in a certain direction, and it kind of ties together with what I want to talk about. But we all have these, these fun and happy feelings this morning. I love to tell the story. I wonder, do you really love to tell that story? Well, there's certainly parts of it that we love to tell, and maybe we like to focus on that side more than the other side. And today I want to talk about something that I am really, really sure about. The Scripture speaks about it. But I don't see people walking around loving to tell about this part, and it's part of the story. And then we had um, our, our Sunday school, and we talked about... Um, our sins. And we talked about, do we always sin and just get saved in our sin, or do we get saved from our sin? Is there victory for us? And can we actually expect to truly live a free life? Is there victory for us? And there is. We know that. And that makes us happy. That makes us joyful. And then I think about this passage of Scripture in 1 Peter, I'm coming back to 1 Peter for the next section in chapter 2. And uh, we're going to break it up into two pieces. One is talking about work or servants, or maybe slaves. And the other one is talking about suffering. And the title for this ser uh, sermon today is um, Suffering Unjustly for Christ. And we live in a time where everything is about living in such a way that I don't have to do anything that doesn't make me too uncomfortable. And I have a lot of rights, and these rights, I deserve to be treated respectfully. And if anybody chooses to disrespect me, I have the full right to walk away from there. I don't have to endure that kind of trash. That's the era we live in. And yet Jesus spoke about his suffering, and Peter speaks to us about suffering. And at some point in the service, I want to take a look at over 20 different passages and just see what does the Bible say about suffering. And is it optional for you and for me? Or is it just for a few of us? Now, obviously, like, I think if I would just say, how many of you know someone who's suffering? Raise your hand. How many of you know somebody who's suffering? Yes, you do. Okay. How many of you feel like right now you are in deep suffering? I'd like to see your hands. We have a few hands. The rest of you, are not, are you not suffering? And what, what is with that? That's, that's the question I want you to think about. So let's turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. I feel like I've already spoken plenty enough about suffering from 1 Peter, and I'm kind of going by section of verses, and this next section of verses talks about it again, and I look at the Word, and I say, Lord, you must have something for us here. And probably doubly so, because we think that suffering is sort of rare for us, and so maybe we need to understand a little better what the Christian life is like what it ought to be like. So the context here is Peter is giving some clear instructions, and he was speaking about being subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. We talked about that in verse 13. Um, before that, we talked about being living stones and a holy people. We were called to something, and he gave us a whole list of mandates. And so today we're looking at verse 18. We're kind of jumping in, and he's just going on to the next group of people, and he's saying, starting in chapter 2 of verse 18, servants. 
be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our soul of your souls. Back towards the beginning, um, we, we noticed immediately, and it, it may seem to you that he's speaking to a certain group of people, servants. And some translations use the word slaves. Uh, this word here specifically talks about domestic servants or household servants. They often were slaves. They had made themselves slaves, or they had been slaves in the household for many years. And in many cases, they, it was not easy. The, the slavery was not, not all masters were kind to their slaves. And these servants did all kinds of tasks. These household slaves in the Roman world did tasks from the menial tasks of housekeeping and cooking all the way up through to whatever the master needed. And there may have been some who were well-dressed and had to go in front of people, but they were serving a master. They were not freed people. And on the, uh, the scale of, of people, there were people who were much higher, but slaves were down fairly low. Servants and slaves were fairly low. Um, you could become a freed person, but sometimes a freed person did not get much more freedom or respect especially than the slaves had. And so sometimes these slaves chose to just stay with their master even if they had been, their time was up, maybe they served for seven years or a time and they were free to go. But here Peter says specifically um, that these servants are to be subject to their masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle but also to the unjust. So I'm thinking about it. How many of you like your job? Do you enjoy working? I'd just like to see how many of you like your job. Now, how many of you, let's just make it real practical. How many of you actually have a boss or a master or something? You have a foreman that you work for. Okay, so not all of you do, but many of you do. Uh, isn't it kind of interesting that you, as you go through life, you have different bosses, and there are some bosses that are absolutely a pleasure to work for. Have I ever told you who my favorite boss was? Some of you schoolboys probably know, don't you? You don't remember? So I worked, uh, the very first summer I came here, I worked at Lanson Metals. And that, I had a great boss, but I had a horrible job. I hate menial tasks where I flip metal all day long. I just hated the job. I tried to be respectful, but I didn't like the job. And then the next summer, uh, maybe two summers later, Peter Ulrich asked if I'd want to wash windows for him. And that was my favorite job. Not that I liked the job itself so well, but I enjoyed working for him and with him. He made you feel like a king. He valued his employees. It didn't matter if it was just a simple window cleaning business, but he made every customer and every employee feel important and really valued. And I, that's just stuck with me all the rest of my life. I keep thinking about the, my interaction with Peter, him being my boss and him telling me how to do it. And he was pretty particular. Um, he was very professional. Um, I worked for uh, Ryan Kimberlin's dad one time doing windows, and he, he wasn't quite as particular, let me just say that. Um, 
you know, he, he got the job done a little faster. But Peter, and he reminded me that he had trained Peter. Peter had been trained by the best, but Peter had taken it to the next level. You know, when you clean a window, you clean it, you squeegee it, and you use three different rags to detail it. One's to get the water off, another one to get it dry, and then another one to make sure there's absolutely no lint and no spots. That was a little much. Uh, when we clean windows, we just use one rag. It's, you know, have a wet one, a dry one, but they're the same blue rag. It's not three different kinds of rags to make sure those windows are clean. But I loved working for him. It didn't matter how picky he was. He made it fun. But not all bosses are that way. And I don't know, if you, I'm sure you've had some experiences where you work for somebody. Maybe it's working for your dad. I must talk to my son. I, I think he enjoys working for other people more than he enjoys working for me. Uh, and that's probably often the case. But there are some bosses that are harder to please or, or hard to know if you ever please them. Maybe they just say nothing at all. And you're just expected to work. And at the end of the day, you hope you were doing an acceptable job. And here, Peter's just saying to these people who are household servants, slaves, he says, do a good job. It doesn't matter if the, sir, if the boss is a good boss or not a good boss. You should always um, respect him and do your best. Not only for the good and gentle, but for the unjust. And that takes it to a whole new level. I, I don't know that there's many, if any of you, that are experiencing a job right now where your boss is being unjust to you. Now that would be tough. And like I said earlier, we have rights in America. And if there's something unjust happening in America with you and your boss, very likely you're not going to stay there very long. Um, and in a lot of cases, it will, it will go to court. It, unjust things with a, between a boss and employee doesn't last very long. There, there are situations like that. But what about unjust suffering? Let's, let's take a little closer look here from verse 19. Two times we have this phrase, a gracious thing. 19 and 20 and 21 maybe. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one suffers sorrow. So I want you to connect this thing. A gracious thing and suffering unjustly. Those two are tied together. If you would circle a gracious thing and then you would circle suffering unjustly and you draw a line between them and say, that's connected. Somehow when you suffer unjustly, that is a gracious thing. However, let me remind you that it is not necessarily a gracious thing if you're not a follower of the Lord. Just because you feel like being kind to your boss, no. It's when you do it, when you're mindful of the Lord. Or go back to verse 13, for the Lord's sake. It's not because of me and me becoming some wonderful person that I can endure unjust suffering. It's when I'm doing it for the Lord's sake. I suffer because the Lord suffered. And that connection. So let's take a look again. So it says very clearly, if you suffer for something you deserve, you did something silly and foolish, and you had to pay for it, you had to suffer for it, you deserved it. There's, there's nothing to say about that. But there are people who are working hard and who are doing a very good job, and they, get to, they still have to suffer. Verse 20, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And that flies in the face of American culture. We don't know how to live that way. And I think most of us have adopted this American culture and this personal rights thing, and we will avoid suffering like the plague. Any, any suffering, we will avoid it. It's, it's just something we don't want to do. And yet God says it's a gracious thing. And I don't know what gracious means other than that it's a good thing, that God blesses that somehow. Somehow God's blessing will flow from you suffering. When you did a good thing, you got spat upon, you got ridiculed, you got hated, and yet you did it out of a heart of respect. First Peter 3 verse 9 kind of ties this together as well. 
Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For, whosoever, for whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are upon, open to, the, to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. If we can remember that as we go through life, a key element that we need to always have in front of it, us is, am I doing this for the Lord? And is the Lord's favor upon me as I do this? The Lord's favor is there for you, but us walking in obedience, no matter what kind of suffering we have to go through, is a key part. I'd like to go on now and just kind of see how this, the rest of this ties together. Um, I'm not talking a lot about enemies today, but Jesus did speak about loving our enemies. In Luke 6, verse 32, love your enemies. And there's a reward or a benefit that the Lord gives us. And here again, suffering unjustly, there's a benefit. The Lord will reward you or there's a gracious, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God, but what's, what's the key part? We have to remember that I have to just remember I'm working for God, and I have God's favor in view. I'm not trying to get my rights or to repay the other person. It will be made up to us someday, but we may not be able to see the justice thing. And we'll talk a little bit more about justice later on. Let's read on from verse 21 and just review this verse again. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. How many of you know that you were called to unjust suffering? Thank you. You know that, Dwight. Yes. And you've experienced it. Yes. Many of us, when we were told the gospel, we got the picture that it was going to be a better life. It is a better life. It's a free life, and our sins are forgiven. But most of us, we're, we're not out there preaching the gospel this way. Please come into the service. Please come follow the Lord, because you need to learn how to suffer unjustly. That's not the first thing we try to tell people. And yet, Jesus is wanting us to understand that walking with Him includes some really hard things. And Peter says, you were called, specifically called, to this. Why? Why were we called to this? And the answer is right there. Because Christ also suffered for you. It's not a suffering where you pay for your sins. Christ has paid for your sins. But there is a suffering where you have fellowship with Christ in His sufferings, and you become joined with Christ. You understand who Christ is. And this fellowship together joins us with Christ. I want us to notice two things. It says, because Christ also suffered for you, that's substitutionary, and then leaving you an example, that's illustration. And I think the next couple of verses, they split that apart. And the first couple of verses, verse 21 and 22, speak about the illustration. So let's look at that first. What kind of example did Jesus leave for us? How should we suffer? For to this you've been, I'm sorry, verse 22. He, Jesus, committed no sin. In his suffering, he committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. How easy when we are suffering or when we know suffering is coming, do we want to twist the truth and hide something that happened and not be totally truthful? And yet Jesus never sinned and he never twisted the, tru the truth. He was willing to face whatever suffering came for him head on. He did not turn to the side. And so Jesus is our example. How do we suffer? We suffer head on and do not lie about it. Verse 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. 
if there's a passage that speaks about non-resistance, this one really does. Jesus is our example, and he says, be like Jesus. You were called to this kind of living. Don't return good for evil. I'm sorry, evil for good. Am I saying it wrong? No, don't, don't return evil for evil. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, but be willing to take what's coming your way and not retaliate. And when you're suffering, don't go threatening anybody. You don't have to threaten the opposite party because Christ suffered and I can suffer too. But this is really hard. This is much harder than it sounds. And so one of the things I'd like to think about is why do we find it so hard to suffer when unjust things happen to us? Because inside of us there's something that tells us justice needs to be served. And if I'm going to let this person go free, then I'm beginning to get afraid that he may not be, justice may not be served to this person, and injustice will continue. Now, I believe there's a right place for us to look out and stop injustices. But if I'm experiencing injustice, I don't need to go and threaten or retaliate. I need to just take it in. Why can I, how in the world can I do this? There's a really key phrase. And remember what I said earlier? Verse 13 said it, for the Lord's sake. And verse 18 said it, if mindful of the Lord. And now in verse 23, what did Jesus do? He fully entrusted himself to him who judges justly. If I were to call the judgment on what this person deserves, I may make the wrong choice. But if I can truly leave it completely in God's hands and I can say, God, I'm going to leave it up to you. You will repay at the right time. God will always keep his promise. And if you feel that some being called righteous, and yet Christ said, if you follow me, if you accept my gift, I have suffered for you. And this suffering he gave and it's a, ex extended to us as a gift. That part we must just receive. And he quotes from Isaiah 53. Now think about the wounds that we have. I think about the healing that we often need and the brokenness that we come to Christ with. Many of us, well, if we're very honest with ourselves, we realize that we're still broken and we still need healing. And there's areas of our lives where we're struggling. We're struggling to connect with our families. We're, we're struggling to walk in victory in certain areas. We're, we're struggling to keep our mind focused on God and to really allow God to be sovereign. And we have to remember, God gave us a gift through Christ. And if we come to Christ and we enter into fellowship with Christ, that's where healing comes from. When Jesus takes our sin and he heals us, he restores our fellowship. And the beautiful thing about it is when he restores our fellowship, he took our sins away. He removes from our hearts the attractiveness of sin. And we need that. But if we're not willing to have Christ come in and restore and heal our hearts, the attractiveness to sin remains there. And I challenge us. We have temptations that we face, and there's many things that want to draw us away from the love of the Father. But if you and I are facing things where we sense that sin becomes attractive to us, let's fall before the Father's throne and say, Father, cleanse my heart. Restore me and heal me because my heart is wicked and I need to be restored. My heart should not be longing for these things. And Christ's healing can come and take that away and really help us understand the sweetness of fellowship with Christ. I'm going to transition now and read just verse by verse. There's one passage that's longer, but most of these are just one or two verses at, at a time. These are different scriptures that speak about suffering for Christ's sake. Peter and the apostles had just come out of jail in Acts 5, verse 41. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, 
rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Do we face shame in our lives? There's many ways that shame comes, our life, uh, comes to us, but are we willing to suffer shame for Christ? Acts 9, 16. Jesus is speaking to Ananias about Saul. For I will show him that it, how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul had a lot of suffering coming for him, and the Lord said he would show him how much suffering. The next one, I'd like you to turn here, Romans 8, 12. Read several verses here. Romans eight twelve. Maybe you're convinced that suffering is for you. Maybe you're not sure yet. This passage makes it really, really clear. Romans eight twelve. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. So many of us want to be glorified with Christ, but are we willing to say, you know what, it says here, provided I suffer, then am I a child of Christ. Then am I an heir. And then I will be glorified. So suffering is not even optional. Romans 8, 36. For as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. 2 Corinthians 1, 7. I have a lot of passages, and I'm remembering there's a translator in the back, so I'll try to say the passages twice. 2 Corinthians 1, 7. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. The apostles knew as they walked through these different churches that they were suffering with others, and they would comfort each other. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. Paul is boasting of how he suffered. I'm actually going to read just a few more verses here. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 21. Second Corinthians 11, 21. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong book. Okay, reading from verse 21. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, 
often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast, Paul says, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, He who is blessed forever knows that I am not lying. Now pause, we'll stop reading there. Philippians 3.10. Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering being conformed to His death. When Paul was giving the list of things that he went through, that was not necessarily something he held on to as giving him salvation, but he served Christ and he was willing to suffer. But here he says why. In Philippians he said that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. 2 Timothy 2.12 2 Timothy 2.12 If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Hebrews 11.25 This is about Moses. Chapter 11, verse 25 Choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than enjoying the passing pleasures of sin. Moses understood that, and he knew that he needed to suffer rather than have pleasures for a short time. James 5.10, chapter 5, verse 10, as an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. And if we just pause there and think of a few prophets, which of the prophets' life do you envy? Would you like to be Daniel in the lion's den? Would you like to be Hosea, who was told to go and marry an adulterous woman? Would you like to marry, I'm sorry, would you like to be um, Jonah? Isaiah, Ezekiel, they lived very hard lives. And here he says, take them as an example. Their suffering is an example for us. First Peter 4, verse 16. Chapter 4, verse 16. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. I think sometimes we associate our suffering with being uh, carrying shame in our lives, and we need to remember that we don't have to carry any shame when we suffer for Christ, but we can glorify God, and we can do it rejoicing. First Peter 5, verse 10, after you have suffered for a while, for a little while, the grace, the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Beautiful promise that when we walk in this suffering, we will be perfected by Christ. We have a few, a few verses from the book of Matthew now, starting with chapter 5, verse 11. Very familiar verse. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Matthew 10, verse 22. You will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. We shy away from being hated. We don't want to be hated. Chapter 10, verse 39. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Chapter 19, verse 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. I don't know what suffering looks like for you. And I think we need to be careful not to think that when we don't have enough pizza and Dr. Pepper in the, in the fridge, that that's suffering. There are other kinds of suffering. But suffering comes in many forms. 
And as we open ourselves and we say, God, what do you have for me? And if we're really going to be honest and say, God, I want you to work in my life in such a way that I know and that you know that you are number one in my life. I like Charles's question in Sunday school. How do I know if I'm keeping Christ's commandments? How do I know if I'm walking with him? But if we are serious with God and we invite him in and we walk with him, we say, I want to know that I'm with you. We will be answered. In the last verse, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, Paul says, He found the power of Christ when he was weak. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I'd like to end with a story out of Tom Doyle's book, Dreams and Visions. This, uh, I'm going to just paraphrase it and give you my version. This happened in Afghanistan. There was a young man who loved peace, and he did not agree with the Taliban and these people who create bombs to go somewhere and just blow cars up, which is fairly common there. He didn't think that that was right. And he wanted to find a way of living in peace. And he developed a habit as a Muslim to go up into this wilderness area and go walking through the woods just praying. And he would specifically pray for himself and for his family and for his country for peace. And especially with all the unrest that was going on, he did not like this eye for an eye idea. And that's not the way he tried to live. And as he would go on these walks, he would feel peace. And he was always looking for peace. And there was one specific place in this forest where he would walk. He would come back to again and again because he knew when he went there, he would meet Jesus. And at some point, he, would, he started going there frequently. For three months, he connected with Christ. And I'm not sure what, in what form or what fashion, but at some point, he, he got to a point in his life where he was hired by somebody to do some translating. And these people were from America, so he connected with them. And this David, this missionary, was speaking to him a lot. Uh, they were handing out food parcels or something. And as they connected, this David began to talk to him and, and help him understand that the only way to, tr to truly find peace is through Christ. I know you're trying to find peace and that you have this aspiration of what peace could look like in your country, but you will never find peace by yourself. And so they began to speak about Christ. And David, uh, this, this young man, thought about it a lot, but there was no way he was going to convert from Islam to Christianity just because of the uh, persecution that he knew was going to come for him. But he decided he's going to continue to pray continue to pray as a service for his country, and continue to be a man of peace. And one day, as he went in, back to his normal little spot where he felt like he could meet with Christ, he noticed immediately there was a presence. There was another person there. But he wasn't afraid because he sensed the peace. Right away, he sensed the peace that this person was bringing with him. And Jesus actually spoke with him. And for three months, Jesus met with him frequently and spoke with him and began to tell him things. And at some point, Jesus tells him, you want peace, but you will never experience true peace until you worship the Prince of Peace. And that was enough for him. He decided to follow Christ, to turn his back on Islam, and he is a bold person now living for Christ and he has, he has been beaten. He's been in prison for, for this. He's been told that he probably won't live long. And here's what he says. I am told that because I love Jesus so openly, one day I will die for my faith in him. I know this is probably going to happen to me, but I am not afraid, and I have the peace of God. 
Once he gave that to me, I had everything. Jesus is all I need. Psalm 73, 26, King David said God was his portion, and that means he alone is enough to sustain me. The words of Jesus in John 14, 15, give me strength, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so this young man learned a way to follow Christ in a place where he knew suffering was for sure going to come for him. And I wonder, what does suffering look like for you? Because I think sometimes we avoid suffering. Many times we avoid suffering. But if we're going to say, Christ, Father, come and work in my heart in such a way that I know for sure that I'm walking in your commandments. And as we walk in those commandments, I think we will face suffering. But Christ will sustain us. I invite you to stand for prayer. Holy Father, we're grateful that you're present here with us and that you've given us your word. We're grateful for the beautiful story of Christ that brings redemption, healing, and freedom, victory. But as we realize you have also called us to suffering, and many of us don't really know what that means. And as we look at that, we know that as Christians we are called to suffer. And in some way or other, you're going to bring suffering into our lives. I pray that we would not be surprised when we face suffering, but that we would turn our faces to you and learn to live and walk in such a way that you become our portion, and we would fully trust in you.